This week in comic books from DC, we get Absolute Power, Task Force 7. And that's really good. And they finally asked the question, where were all the supervillains? Well, all the superheroes that get rounded up. What was going on there? Over in the lands of Marvel, we get X-Men 1. It picked up where Kakoa left off. And we get our first peek at our Marauders. X-Men Marauders. It's pretty cool. It's good art. It's good stuff. I'm going to talk about that one. And then in Independence, for some reason, we got Human Fly. <laughs> Issue 0. Yeah, uh, hopefully that's a one and done. All that and loads of other comic books. But first, allow me to tantalize your taste buds with my coffee. Hey, what's going on, folks? This is your boy, Pocan Joe, to talk to you about Coffee Brand Coffee. We serve people that are tired of gimmicky advertising and branded companies that want to lecture you. At Coffee Brand Coffee, all we want to do is serve you freshly roasted coffee wherever you're at, whenever you want it. Consider Coffee Brand Coffee. Check us out, check our reviews out, and use promo code POCANJOE or the link down in the description to save yourself some money. Give me the opportunity to get you a delicious cup of coffee. All right, you wonderful weirdos. Let's jump into this week's comic book haul and review. We're going to kick this off, as I mentioned in the beginning. Absolute Power, Task Force 7, number one. This is pretty cool. So in this one, we basically just go through the roundup of uh, catching Shazam. Um, or not just Shazam, but Captain Marvel, Mary Marvel, and even the Black Adam in this one. What did we learn from it? The Amazo robot, like the head one, the, the, the badass one. Right, it can apparently suck up magical powers too. So it's not just that ability, but the magic stuff as well. Why do I find that interesting? I don't, because I don't like woo woo. But for the most part, it was a good read. I really love the artwork in this. It's very clean, and you get the, you know, the Shazam comic book has been kind of kid, more kid driven lately. So in this one, you get a Tyrannosaurus Rex that's like a librarian, I guess. So, yeah, all in all, I like this. But it did ask the question in here, are only the superheroes getting rounded up? Now, I asked this in the uh, not tie in the absolute power issues, and that's a good question. My speculation, you ready for this? Here's where I think is going on with the supervillains, since they didn't tell us in this issue. They're all together in a secret volcano layer someplace. They're hiding out in a volcano. Why a volcano? Because it's always always a volcano whenever the superheroes need to come together and go and hide prove me wrong <laughs> all right moving on uh i went ahead and picked up action comics this is 1067 um this is the i believe the arc to a new story here but what's cool about this is it, it reads like an older issue like an older silver age early bronze age issue where we have some aliens that are coming to earth and they're demanding Earth, and Superman's like, nah, kid, you can't have Earth. Earth, you know, I, I protect these people. And, of course, it being a delegation of aliens, they're like, okay, pick your champion, right? Gladiator-style combat. And, of course, Superman has to meet this huge monster. But in this one where he was trying to figure out who his, like, they wanted him to have, like, a backup. And he's, like, picking all these through his mind who he wants. It turns out it's end up going to be Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen. Why? Because that's the comedy part of this. And that is absolutely hilarious. So that was pretty good. Um, I, I don't think I would spoil it if I said, you know, he, he's beating the monster. That's, that's not a problem. But their choice of combat, they just lifted an aircraft carrier into the air. And they're going to make that like the arena to fight on. Oh, that was weird. Like, that's the most random thing you can come up with. And that's why I said it kind of feels like a Silver Age or an early Bronze Age. Because that's, that's the kind of stuff they would put in back then. Like, just... For, uh, look. I drew an aircraft carrier. Put it in the comic book. Okay. Moving on. We got Sinister Sons number six. And this concludes this arc, right? So we, we finally... The son of Sinestro finally said, Hey, I think I'm your son. He checks it out. He's like, Ah, yeah, you are. Becomes a real big jerk to him. And he does this to kind of breed him into being, um, well, what Sinestro is, right? So he can kind of understand that concept, which was really good. Kid Zod in this as well uh, kind of gets the same sort of test to him. And really it's just, I'm just going to beat you kids up. 
aliens. What are you going to do? Um, and, of course, this hones them, and now they're really proud, right? Because they, they passed the test, if you will. And now they've been put in charge of being the guards of this particular planet that Sinestro runs. And immediately their mind goes to, well, if we're in charge, then we obviously need to build an army. Because, you know, we need to tell people what to do, not do it ourselves. Why would you do that? So, oh, please, I want to see that fiasco. I want to see the... the the expectation of leadership just crumble <laughs> as it does when people fantasize about it. I want to see that in a comic book. I think that would be great. Definitely let me know what you think about that. Just so much comedy in that. So much comedy. All right. Let's jump into Marvel now. All right. So, yeah, X-Men. I had to go with the just crazy character cover there where it has, like, everybody. For some reason... And yeah, I'm the guy that does that. I was looking through this, and Nightcrawler appears in it several times. Like, in this kind of kitty version. But he's kind of all over the place. And he's the only one that has a multiple of himself in there. Even his evil version. I thought that was interesting. Too much about the cover, I know. But let's jump into it. So what's going on here? The Age of Kokoa has ended, right? So we need to kind of... What's that next big story we're getting into? And it's about the X-Men rebuilding themselves. And here with the Marauders, a brand new team led by Cyclops. Who doesn't like Cyclops? Mr. Soldier Boy himself has a fantastic team with him. It, juggernaut's in it. A couple of characters I don't know very well. And, uh, oh, the girl with the sword. The big sword. It jumps in and out of dreams. She was in Young Mutants or New Mutants. Yeah. Lila, Leela... It's the French girl. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're all on the team together. And um, they're kind of, uh, well, they're out there doing their original mission, right? Go out there, get those kids out there that are about to go through that mutant transformation, right? Grab them so they have a safe environment to grow up in. The problem is, is that somebody's figured out how to fake this to where it sets off their their main uh, machine to figure it out. Cerebral. I don't know why I have trouble today. It's just a bad day. Help me out here. <laughs> it's cerebral. Uh, but because they're adults, but they also have mutant powers as well. But for some reason, it was registering them as, you know, the kids, right? So that's interesting. I want to know why that's happening. And of course, it's happening in a lab someplace, even where um, the lab was so sophisticated that it actually had Wolverine tied up in it. And his old fat. You remember the cover where he's like strung out on the X, right? Yeah, they had him up on one of those things. I thought that was a great little homage inside of a comic book. I thought that was smart. Love the artwork in here. Some newer designs to some characters, right? Uh, some newer characters that if you haven't been following the run, you may be out a little bit, but that's okay. They're kind of cool. They're just what a kid would be today. Um, and also, Beast takes a sheriff on a tour of the new X-Man factory place, a, a old Sentinel manufacturing plant. Uh, to kind of, you know, make sure nobody's out of control. And Magneto seems kind of, like, sketchy again. Not in a diplomatic, noblesque way like he did in Kokoa, but more of a, I could kill you <laughs> way. I could legit kill you. It was crazy. Um, but to see that type of location and know that there's going to be other ones out there, I'm kind of wanting to get back into X-Men again. Kokoa lost me. Um, I know there's a lot of fans of it. But that's not a criticism of it. it. Just wasn't for me, so I didn't buy it. But I could see myself getting into this, especially if they keep the artwork and the story arc and just the action pace going in it. I need a comic book with action in it. I read boring stuff at work. I want to read exciting things at home. All right, moving on. Kid Venom. So this may lose some people. <laughs> You're probably thinking uh, Eddie Brock's kid dylan that's kid venom right you'd think that right because they even did a series with him and everything else right and everybody affectionately called him no this deals with a different kid in a different time era and a different venom yeah parasite i don't know but this takes place in feudal japan with samurais right there's like a samurai cult that goes around and defeats these and i'm gonna mispronounce this i'm gonna spell it right here as well oni honey evil spirits and of course these evil spirits are represented as kind of like carnage type characters in here you may remember carnage and the kid obviously has the symbiote with him so he's like this kid training to be a samurai and has like super duper hero powers at the same time 
right? This is weird. Normally, this isn't my kind of thing, um, given the artwork and everything else involved in it. Um, but I, and it's very anime, I should say that. That's probably the other reasons. I'm not like a huge fan of anime. Like, there are some things I can kind of get behind. Uh, like One Piece, the show. That was pretty cool. Um, and things like that. But th but I liked the story. So I'm willing to look past the artwork and all the weirdness with it. Uh, just to kind of get this really cool story. Plus it's samurais. You know what that means. Swords. I love a good sword. Alright, moving on. Incredible Hulk number one. Blood Hunt. Um, so this is a blood hunt tie-in. We've been chasing down the blood hunt stuff. And we get occasional tie-ins here. And I really regret getting this one. Because it is absolutely not relevant to the main storyline whatsoever. This is just Bruce Banner walking the desert. Comes across an old movie studio. Where a gentleman that um, came from Mexico. By escaping into it. I'm trying not to be topical here, I'm really, but we get it, right? He snuck into the U.S. But he found himself work on this movie studio and has been working at this particular one for a while. Um, apparently his parents passed away at some point and there are vampires under the ground. And this is where it's not really, like, they, they just threw Blood Hunt on this. It's not really a Blood Hunt tie-in story because it doesn't make much sense compared to what's going on in Blood Hunt. But whatever. Guess what Hulk does? Vampires come out, try to kill Bruce Banner, he turns into Hulk, and just tears him up. And there's no real depth to this story whatsoever. Um, <laughs> it's just that, you know, that one topical thing, and that's about it, really. Is it? Alright, Silver Surfer. Who doesn't like a good Silver Silver story? Boom! Mm, too bad we didn't really get a story. Ugh, right? It sounds like I'm being rough on comic books this week. I'm really not. Hear me out. This is just a reminder of who... Silver Surfer is. Comic books do this every now and then, where they kind of just launch a quick story out about a character, just so you understand the character, and they always highlight things they want you to remember. Like, for instance, Silver Surfer is not his real name. He didn't become Silver Surfer until Galactus gave him the uh, cosmic powers. Powers cosmic is what they call it, right? Which turned him into the Silver Surfer, so he can surf through space and get things ready for Galactus to eat. His real name is Nolan Rad. He's an alien life form someplace out in the world where is someplace out in the universe, I should say, where um, Galactus destroyed his planet and picked him to be his kind of avatar to, to go out there and prep things before he decides to eat it. A couple of things the book just wants you to know. There are other ones, right? Like we should kind of, your mainstream weekly readers, old time readers, a lot of you already know this, but just in case, because there may be something in the works and i've noticed this right before certain movies come out and certain things start happening in the cinematic universe or in the show universe the comic books always have this kind of weird where they launch out a couple of weird comic books that are just informational like this just bow wrapped with a story behind it is that speculation on my part i'll say yes that would be fair but um it wouldn't surprise me if something happens where we don't get Something with Silver Surfer very soon. So, there you go. There's that. All right, moving on. Let's talk about this human fly thing. First off, to all my brothers and sisters in Canada, I apologize. <laughs> Why? Because he's a Canadian, right? He's a Canadian. And this, I don't know what the... Like, I've never met anybody that's like huge human fly fan over here. That's straight up. <laughs> it's like, ah. Uh, so if you don't know who the human fly is, basically he's just a daredevil. Not daredevil superhero thing, but more like a stuntman, right? Rides the motorcycles, does weird flips, can't ever fall, has a great sense of agility, the whole nine yards, right? He's the whatever human aspect you want inside of a superhero enhanced. Okay? In this one, we get this weird story where he's got to save uh, Justin Trudeau. I believe that's the president in Canada or the prime minister. I'm not really sure what a prime minister is, to be honest with you. So, there's that. Apparently an important person. Like a president? I'm just going to go ahead and say that. So, um, and he hires this new guy to check out all of his equipment before he goes to do this big stunt for Justin Trudeau and uh, 
the guy, of course, fails at it, right? Because it's really in the ah ha ha thing. It's, it's, it's. I feel stupid explaining this. I really do, because technically it should only take about three sentences, right? Nothing really deep to this. Um, I mean, I could see the lore if you like the Daredevil character. You just don't want him to be blind and ride a motorcycle. And you take away his cool little cane whip thing. And completely make him lame. There you go. Moving on. Transformers number 10. So I'm digging this. We've had two odd occurrences in Transformers now. That I think is a little interesting. And maybe we should kind of take a step back and look at this. <laughs> All right, so we've had two characters now that have taken more of this uh, um, passive role. Like, they did, they, they don't want to fight anymore. And in this one, we find out Beachcomber, who was just shown in the last comic book, saved Spike in the whole nine yards. Um, he's just like, he found the Transformers in their ship, you know, kind of hibernating in there, and chose not to cut them on. Same thing with the Decepticons, because he was like, because we'll just start the war again. And I'm done with the war. And he's like really fascinated with everything on Earth. From plant life, the animal life, the whole nine yards, right? Like this is his jam. He enjoys this. He enjoys Earth. Um, on the flip side, and this is, oh, I should say, this is the second time we've seen this sort of passive attitude. One from Beachcomber and the other one from Cliffjumper. You may remember Cliffjumper is like, I'm just tired of fighting to the point to where it got him. Right? I think that's interesting and it's something to, interesting to add in comic books right because you know constantly in a state of battle whether it's you know with uh, that computer I hate it in this constant state of battle whether it's you know mentally socially or an actual combat whatever the case may be eventually it just wears you down you get tired of it right you're just like I don't care anymore and you start to learn to enjoy other things or at least I hope you would that would be a positive aspect to it negative aspect is you hate everything therefore you hate everybody that's not a good place to be Right. Uh, another thing we find out what the big scheme of the Decepticon was the whole time here as Shockwave decides he's like why should we travel all the way back to our world when we can just bring it here and you know what that means if you've seen the Transformers movie uh, you know what that could do that could be a different world <laughs> so without spoiling anything pick of the week I love this I love the newer nuances to it I love the fact that they're telling a full holistic story behind it and giving us more insight than just having superficial characters shooting lasers, pew pewing it out with each other. Like we actually get some depth with the characters in this, and I think that's why it's my pick of the week. Definitely. You ready for the fireworks? Here we go. Boom. Boom. All right, guys, that is my haul and review for this week. A lot of interesting things have been going around the community lately over at Gary B's 1011. I was just on there last night. Uh, we got to chit chatting with Fable Station. Love that dude. Uh, and I was able to be a co host on there. We had a great time. We're just laughing it up, talking in comic books, a bunch of bros talking it out. It was a good time. Good time. Always happy to be over there. Um, and I got an idea for a possible little short thing we can do on this channel. Should be fun. Um, but other than that, I don't think I have anything else. I'll see you all soon on the chats and uh, catch you around.